everybody, it's Dr. Mary Gardner, and I have a special guest friend with me today that I'm super excited about because not only is Dr. Michael Wong a friend, but he's also a fellow Gator. Yes. So go Gators. We both went to the same vet school. And um, I don't know if you know this, uh, uh, Dr. Wong, but my first day of vet school, I remember you had just graduated and you came in to like talk about being a vet and, or being a vet student and don't panic and all that stuff. So you are, you are awesome. And uh, I just remember that you coming in as you graduated. So Dr. Michael Wong, I have to ask you, I did not just bring you on because you're fun and you're a gator. You are a specialist yep. and neuro a veterinary neurologist. So can you tell me what everybody, what that means? Yeah. So, so just like in people where uh, human doctors specialize in, you know, oncology or cardiology or dermatology, veterinarians specialize in, in different disciplines. And the discipline that I specialize in is, is neurology. So basically problems that affect the nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, the muscles. So <clears throat> conditions we might see are things like seizures, like brain problems. Um, you know, difficulty walking in all four legs. Uh, so we'll see different problems in the spinal cord of the neck or in the back or um, in, in the nerves. So many times really dramatic stuff, sometimes really scary stuff, things that I think lots of people think um, and lots of veterinarians are think is, is, is scary or sad, but, you know, it's what I'm really passionate about. And, you know, I've always liked that seizure is very dramatic. Okay, I can treat the seizure, and you know the dog looks better, and it's it's a very dramatic turnaround. That that dog that's paralyzed, you know, looks scary, looks like we're you know no no hope, and we can provide that that hope and that fix, and that dog gets better. Um, so those are the things that really really interest me. So for the Grey's Anatomy fans out there, you're basically McDreamy of the vet space. <laughs> I don't know. I think, yes. So that is, I remember neurology used to kind of scare me a little bit because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the big deal. It's the brain. And you guys are removing tumors from brains and radiation and, and, uh, you know, discs and just going in surgery on the spinal cord. Like it's, it's awesome. And I hats off. And I, uh, so you founded Southeast Veterinary Neurology 7. Uh, which I have here, and that is here in South Florida. And you guys have, I, I would welcome everybody who's watching to go follow your your social media because you put these videos that I've told you you're my favorite, favorite group to watch the videos because they're awesome to see the before and after of dogs with like no, all four legs are dragging. And then you're like three weeks later and they're walking, which is, which is miraculous. So um, okay, so Dr. Sheila Robertson had to say here, what an excellent choice for Dr. Neurology. Robertson. I love it. Awesome. Okay, so I could talk, I've got a list of topics that throughout the year I'm going to try to drag you on to talk about, like seizures, like vestibular problems. And you know I love the, the things that happen to old uh, dogs and cats. So um, oh, good, everybody's saying hi to you. So excuse me as I look. But I wanted to focus today on something I see a lot, uh, which is degenerative myelopathy. So I'll put it there because it's a it's a it's a mouthful for some people, and it is uh, something that I know that that your team and you you see uh, a lot of when people come to you. So can you explain what is degenerative myelopathy? Yeah. So um, myelopathy just means a problem in the spinal cord. So it's a fancy word way of saying spinal cord problem and. Um, degenerative is just like you assume it's a degeneration. So there's a uh, degeneration of the spinal cord. Um, the spinal cord's job is to carry the information from the brain, you know, down the neck, down the back to the back legs and the tail and the pooper and the pier. And, um, and then the information back up from there up to the brain. So, so the brain's saying, you know, walk and the legs are saying here, here's where I am in space. And the brain is sort of sensing that. So, um, degenerative myelopathy is typically happens in, in the spinal cord of, of the back. And so we classically see, um, rear limb weakness and, and in coordination because that connection from, um, the, 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 the 
the back legs to the, the head saying where I am in space, you know, there's a problem in the spinal cord or in that information and the brain saying to the legs, you know, be strong. Um, so we see weakness and incoordination in, in the back legs. Um, what about the tail? Um, so usually, um, you know, the, 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 the big thing that we're seeing is the back legs. Yeah. Eventually what happens with it, and don't want to jump ahead. I'm not, not sure exactly what you're going to ask, but, um, you know, <laughs> this is good. We're, we're going crazy. We're, we're going to make this whatever we make it. So, um, usually tail paralysis or, you know, stuff like that isn't something that we, we classically see as, as a problem. Um, eventually dogs can become urinary or fecal incontinent as, as it progresses. Um, but really rear limb weakness and uh, incoordination is kind of the primary thing that we see. Is the first um, thing. So if you, um, so the, the weakness, and that could be a lot of people consider that, oh, this is just him getting old and he's getting tired, or maybe it's arthritis or some other problems, right? And so is it normally both sides or one side? So will you see limping or will you see just like weakness? Yeah, so I, I guess there are a couple other things that we take into account when we're trying to say, is this degenerative myelopathy or not? I mean, because <clears throat> lots of other things can affect the spinal cord or lots of other things can cause dogs to, to be weak. Um, so things that we're expecting with a dog with degenerative myelopathy, we see it in certain breeds. Um, it's, a, it's a genetic condition. So we see it in certain breeds of dogs. Um, the German Shepherd's kind of the classic breed, but we'll see it in uh, Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. We'll see it in Boxers. We'll see it in Corgis. Um, and it usually comes on slowly. So it's not this sudden, I go from, I'm a running dog to I'm dragging my back legs. It's usually kind of this, slow over months, you know, that the owners notice, well, gosh, you know, my dog just isn't as strong, isn't as coordinated as, as he or she used to be. Um, usually they're older dogs, uh, you know, kind of nine, 10 years old is, is when symptoms are, are first noted. And it's usually not painful. Um, so that's kind of many of the things that we're looking for to say, well, gosh, is this a, a neurological problem um, or not? And is this neurological problem consistent with degenerative myelopathy or something else? So um, like you said, arthritis can cause difficulty walking, you know, often affects older large breed dogs. And, you know, sometimes we might, you know, we're presented with a dog, well, is this because of an orthopedic problem? Is this because of arthritis or is this because of um, a spinal cord problem? And that's kind of one of our, our primary jobs is saying, does this look more like a, a neuro problem or an ortho problem? Um, sometimes we have both. And quite frankly, oftentimes we have both. But one of the things that we see that makes us much more uh, suspicious of a neurological problem is kind of dragging of the toes. So um, dogs that have arthritis, um, dogs that have bad knees, you know, sometimes we'll see more of a lameness where they don't want to put weight on the leg or they're, they're slow to get up, you know, they kind of, they're worse after resting, you know, if they've been laying in their bed for a long time, they have a hard time getting up. Whereas um, degenerative myelopathy, a pure spinal cord problem, you know, we're, we're not necessarily worse after laying down, but instead of seeing difficulty putting weight or, or bearing weight, we're seeing more in coordination, like we're starting to scuff our toes um, sometimes as it advances, we see maybe crisscrossing of the back legs. Um, so that, that's thing number one that we're trying to sort out is, is this a neurological problem or an orthopedic problem? And sometimes it's both. Yeah. Um, and you know, the other neuro problem I see a lot, which I did a different Facebook live on, uh, is, is degenerate or a geriatric onset laryngeal paralysis and polyneuropathy, a big word, gulp. So I could see where that gets confused too, because it's very similar in the hind end. Yeah. So um, th that's, you know, I'd say less common um, for, for seeing them as, as difficulty walking. Um, but yes, I mean, they're both degenerative conditions. We both, we see both of those classically in larger old breed dog. Wow. <laughs> Older, large breed dogs. 
Um, so, so there's I plenty. I swear, everyone, he is boarded and smart. <laughs> exactly, but book smart, as my wife likes to to tell me. But uh, um, so older, large breed dogs. So we si similar population of dogs. Um, that's again another thing that we tell on our examination. So. Um, a dog with degenerative myelopathy, what we expect to, to see is um, they're usually able to walk when we first meet them. Um, the front legs seem pretty strong, but the back legs <clears throat> are kind of crisscrossing or, or scuffing. Um, you know, the owner doesn't describe any pain. It kind of came on slowly and it's slowly getting worse. Um, <clears throat> but when we do our neurological examination, um, their, their reflexes are still normal. So we'll, we'll, we'll tap on their knees. I'm pretending like this is my knee or this is a dog's knee. You know, if we tap there, there's still that knee jerk reflex. When we pinch on the toes of the rear limbs, usually they'll still pull them back. Same thing in the front legs. Um, usually their, their bark is still nice and strong. Um, so as opposed to the, the um, polyneuropathy and laryngeal paralysis type dogs, you know, many times the first thing that owners notice is yes, the rear limbs are weak, um, but they walk a little different. You know, many times the front legs are a little clumsy as well, not quite as obvious as the back legs. Um, the history is usually similar. Hey, it's kind of come on slowly and, you know, getting worse, but it's, it's our examination. Usually those dogs with the polyneuropathies, you know, they've got a bark change or they're kind of breathing funny, or when we pinch on their toes or tap on their, their, their knees, they don't have, normal reflexes so um but that's certainly one of the first things we're trying to, to tell when, when we meet a dog is it neurological or orthopedic assuming it's neurological is it affecting the spinal cord the brain or the nerves and muscles where polyneuropathy is nerves and muscles where degenerative myelopathy is um, spinal cord the spine now is there a test that you guys can take to see if a dog has a gene so uh, you, you did this and, and it was a very le leading question with, with answering that does it have a gene. So um, I, I, we may have skipped or, or glossed over that, that it is a genetic problem. You know, years, I mean, even when, when Dr. Mary and I were in school, um, we didn't know that it was a, we had not identified the, the gene at that point. So, um, you know, but before us, you know, is it nutritional? Is it environmental? you know, things like that. And back when, when we were in school, you know, they were just starting to do things like MRIs. Uh, um, they were still doing myelograms and, you know, if they were lucky, a CAT scan. So the way I approach diagnosing a dog with degenerative myelopathy right now, to, to me, the first thing is is uh, signalment and history. You know, if, if this is a one-year-old dog, you know, um, or it came on suddenly, or the dog's really, really painful. You know, even if it's a nine-year-old German Shepherd that's really painful or came came on suddenly, that's not really sounding like degenerative myelopathy to me. So the first thing is, is it an appropriate age, breed, um, the, the the story we're hearing from the owner? You know, of, of when it came on, did it come on slowly? Is it progressing? To me, that's sort of piece of the puzzle number one with regards to. Uh, coming to a, a diagnosis of degenerative myelopathy. Um, piece of the puzzle number two is just my, my examination. Um, just like we kind of talked about with that polyneuropathy thing, you know, the, the signalment and history can sound pretty darn similar between those two, but it's my exam that says, yes, this is a spinal cord problem. Um, yeah, the dog doesn't seem painful. Um, yeah, it seems like it's a mid-back spinal cord problem because um, that's Classically, where degenerative myelopathy starts is uh, the in the mid back, and our symptoms are just rear limb weakness with with normal front limbs, what we call thoracic limbs. So, puzzle piece number two in getting that diagnosis to me is my my examination. Um, from there, yes, there are, are tests um, because even if I've got a ten year old German Shepherd, non painful, slowly progressive rear limb weakness, there are other... It sounds like you're checking the boxes there, the DM boxes. Yep, so it sounds just like DM from my, my signalment and history from my examination. There are still other neurological conditions that can look the exact same. So 
you know, 10 year old German shepherds can, can get tumors of their spinal cord. They can get um, slipped discs. We classically think of a slipped disc as coming on suddenly and being painful, but not always. So we can see um, stoic dogs or dogs that, you know, the disc is, uh, I guess, more slowly compressive. Um, we can see malformations of so fluid pockets on the outside of the spinal cord that, that can cause the exact same symptoms. So tests are usually warranted in order to give a definitive diagnosis. So um, we recommend MRIs here. Um, there are different ways. You know, you can start off with plain x-rays. That's a good way for screening for like broken bones, tumors of bone, infection of bone. Um, but usually those things are all painful. So it, it isn't enough to show you the spinal cord so that you can say, you know, yes, this is degenerative myelopathy. So an MRI gives us a picture of the spinal cord and we can see, is there a tumor? Is there a malformation, a fluid pocket, a cyst? Um, and are there disc bulges that are significant enough to be causing the symptoms? Um, I personally don't do a lot of spinal taps for dogs that I'm strongly suspicious of degenerative myelopathy based off of, you know, all those puzzle pieces. And if I get a normal MRI or an MRI that has just a mild disc bulge, I often won't do a spinal tap. Um, many neurologists will. So I don't think there's a right or wrong there. To me, that's just another data point um, of ruling things and out. And just ruling like out infection or fungus or, you know, something like that, right? So. Yep. Now I, I'll say, so my girl, Sam, I had an Anatolian shepherd, which many people like, you know, I talked about her like last year a lot. So she had what I was considering definitely DM. So I, you know, the weakness, just when she's in front of her food bowl would start to like sink a little bit and then get back up and scuff in the toes. It was slow. And I'm like, ah, Dr. Wong, my girl's got DM. So I brought her to you guys. And so Dr. Serta at your place, who was my classmate, was the, the neurologist that, that took care of her. And yeah, her little feet flip in. And so I did the MRI and it's very important to do because I was a thousand percent, she's got DM and I'm a you know vet, but you know, you're a, you're a dog or cat mom first or you know dad. Totally. So you go a little crazy. So I was a little crazy and you guys treated me very well there. So thank you seven. But she ended up having spinal lymphoma. So she had cancer in her spinal cord. Like we would not have ever known that if, unless we did the MRI. So it's, and that treatment, totally different. Totally. And uh, so it was really important. Yeah. And, and then the, the I mean, f fantastic point. Um, and, and then the last piece of that puzzle is this genetic test. Yeah. Um, so in like, I was it 2009, 2010 ish, um, uh, researchers in, in Missouri found the um, mutation in, uh, it's called a SOD1 gene, um, that if you have two bad copies of it, um, you're, it's very strongly associated with degenerative, excuse me, with developing degenerative myelopathy. Um, so it's a fantastic piece of the puzzle, you know, kind of what I'm often telling veterinarians and telling pet parents you know, is by itself, it's not enough to give, give us an answer. So, you know, the question becomes, well, gosh, can't I just do this test and it will tell me, does my dog have DM or not? Um, <clears throat> basically what it's telling us is, does my dog have two bad copies of it? So we're at risk of developing degenerative myelopathy and, you know, it needs to be strongly on our worry list if all of these other things that we you know, we, we said are true. Um, do I have zero bad copies or, or two normal copies, which in that case, it's incredibly unlikely that it's degenerative myelopathy. And then do we have one good and one bad where those dogs, there, there are reports of dogs with one good, one bad, still developing degenerative myelopathy and being um, diagnosed at, at, yeah. uh, at, at, you know, uh, at, at autopsy or, or necropsy. Um, but they also use that just for, for breeding purposes in that, you know, we're, we're That's passing, what I was going to say it's good for, for breeding. And, and maybe if somebody does want to have a certain breed dog, they should ask that the parents have gotten tested. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, they they have to be careful for, for all genetic things as, you know, do we 
use that as we, we only breed, you know, these dogs as opposed to these or, or these, because um, there are other, you know, characteristics that might be accidentally, you know, bred out or bred in making those sure. decisions. So it needs to be part of the decision. Um, so to me, that's how I diagnose degenerative myelopathy. I've got appropriate age, breed, signalment history. I've got appropriate clinical signs. I've ruled out other things with an MRI plus or minus spinal tap and I, I get the genetic test. Um, and when I've got all of those, you know, the puzzle piece comes together because the only way you can truly diagnose it is histopathologically. So um, it's not easy for us to, in a live dog, you know, sample the, the spinal cord and look at it under a microscope. So the, the way that we diagnose it in a live dog is, is just, just how I said. Right. So for those of you that histopathology means basically right. taking a piece of the spinal cord, looking under a microscope, that's that's after the pet has passed. So it's definitely something that that we can't do before. Or uh, Now, to your point about why don't we just do the test and not do the MRI uh, or do, you know, my girl Sam could have could have had the gene yeah. for for it. But but it's not that's not her problem. Her problem was the cancer in her spine. And it, it, I, exactly. I elected to do chemo and radiation, which we would never have known about if we just said, oh, she's got the genes. That must be what it is. It, or she it, has a painful thing like a disc that we wanted to, you could do surgery on. Yep. So that's very important. Yeah. And, and, and when we meet pet parents, you know, we kind of just, our job is to discuss, you know, here's the rationale for that. And, you know, the downsides of MRIs and the cost. And we totally understand that, you know, not every family can, can, can do True. that. Um, you know, so is it still reasonable, you know, to do a consult, do x-rays, do a, a, a DM screen? Is that more information? Is that more pieces of the puzzle than had we not done them? Absolutely. But usually it's not enough to completely rule out. So um, like you said, you could have a, you know, 10 year old golden, or excuse me, German shepherd with appropriate signs and a positive DM, but it's got a, a tumor. It's got a disc. It's got all the things that you said. I think I, yeah. And I think it is very important to know that not every clinic or has an MRI nearby. Not everybody can afford it because it's not cheap. And it's also, we don't just because we can, doesn't mean we have to. Uh, what I, what, you know, I think I, I'm on the side of our veterinarians where some people will say, well, my vet didn't diagnose it correctly. Well, sometimes we're only working with a few tests and, you know, be kind because that's what we've got. No judgment either which way. So <clears throat> I didn't have to do the MRI. I just, I was, I needed to know. <laughs> uh, so you, the other thing to which people get scared about, especially in older dogs, and I did a Facebook Live with Dr. Sheila on this like a year ago, is anesthesia and MRIs. Dogs don't just sit still, do they? Yeah. It's yeah, so so great great point. You know, we need to do anesthesia for an MRI um, of, of the back. You know, MRIs take longer than, you know, x-rays. It's, it's like a, you know, a snapshot, um, very, very quick. You know, we don't necessarily need to be anesthetized, whereas for an MRI, dog needs to hold still for an extended period of time, you know, 50 minutes, hour and a half, somewhere in there to, you know, depending on the size of the dog and how much we're looking at. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a risk of anesthesia. And those are the things that we talk about with clients. Um, from an anesthetic standpoint, you know, and Dr. Sheila is going to... <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so, so that th that was the amount of knowledge that I have compared to her. Just compared to, I know anybody was wondering what what I was doing with my pinky there. Um, so, we always talk about you know anesthetic risks with clients, and and whenever we're making a recommendation, we're we're kind of weighing those pros and cons: the likelihood of it giving us information that either lets us help that dog or lets us you know know what we're dealing with versus the risks of anesthesia versus the cost. So, you know, that's something that we always, all veterinarians are always taking into account. And when we're making the recommendation for a test, whether it requires anesthesia, whether it's blood work, whether it's x-rays, you know, we're making that recommendation in, in that we think the likelihood of us helping your pet, you know, outweighs the downsides of it. Um, anesthesia, back when we used to do myelograms, um, I, I felt that, that, 
dogs with DM would get transiently worse after a myelogram. Um, some people, you know, wondered, was that the anesthesia? Um, for, for me, it was more the myelogram because, you know, nowadays we're doing MRIs that are longer. They, they require more anesthesia than a myelogram or a CT myelogram. Mm -hmm. But but I don't see those dogs wake up worse, whereas dogs when you were doing myelograms um, would. I see. Yeah. Now, quick question before I get to my big question is, do cats get this? Uh, to, to my knowledge, cats do not get degenerative myelopathy. Um, I didn't think so, but I thought I got a neurologist. Let me ask a good question. If, I, if, I, if you've got a cat that's slowly getting weaker in its, you know, in its rear limbs, there are lots of other things that we're yeah. thinking of. Lymphoma, I know. Yeah, that would be my top one there too. Th th those would be kind of the two main things. that would be So I know there's no cure to this, which is really sad. And I, I know you were a little bit worried coming on here. Like, I don't have good news, Mary. So it, it, it sucks because there is no cure for this, but we can manage it. Yep. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, how long though? So from diet, it's so hard to say how long do they have because they could have had symptoms for a year and before their diagnosis or, you know, so of course when you catch it, but on average, uh, so, you know, how will a pet die from this? Let's go straight to the core. How will sure. they die from this? Um, the, the likelihood is that they're going to be euthanized um, because of it. So most dogs, you know, the bigger dogs, I'm meeting when symptoms have been, have been going on for, you know, five or six months. That's just kind of the classic time where, where owners come in. Um, from the time of that diagnosis, you know, kind of the next thing that happens is um, they, they become weaker and weaker and weaker, and eventually they get weak enough that, that they can't walk. Um, and average for that, and again, it's an average, um, is, is about 11, 12 months. And some pet parents, you know, will say, hey, at the point of diagnosis, that's the time to stop. You know, some owners say, well, when my 11 year old, you know, shepherd now can no longer walk, you know, that's the time that I'm going to stop. Some people will put their dogs in, in wheelchairs um, and, and they'll keep going, you know. After that, one of the things that happens is they become urinary and or fecal incontinent. And that's kind of the deal. next time it's a, it's a huge management issue. You know, it's one thing if you've got a chihuahua that's having poop and pee incident accidents, but, you know, a 80 pound dog with, you know, poop and pee accidents is, is a whole other animal. Um, so that's kind of where we, we lose sort of our next subset of, of, of pets, you know, where owners just say, OK, you know it's not getting better. It's not going to get better. You know, she can't walk now. And, and now, um, you know, she, she's pooping on herself, whether it's the, the, the dignity aspect or the, the management aspect, that's kind of where we, we lose the, the, the next, um, subset. Mm -hmm. Um, if not, if, if a pet is not euthanized, um, eventually they're going to start showing weakness in the front legs. And eventually they're going to start showing um, what we call cranial nerve signs. So, so problems, um, problems of the nerves, you know, for, for swallowing and for, um, for nerves around the face. So what about breathing? So, yeah. So, so if nothing was done, eventually yes the dog would have a difficult time breathing and it would be I a very like to bring this up because there are some people who you know yep. don't want mother nature and don't want euthanasia and i think it's good to set expectations of what the next step is and and in those cases i'm going to strongly recommend definitely getting hospice care because i don't uh and not that hospice means we don't euthanize but i want to make sure that the pet has you know palliative care yeah. So the, I guess the silver lining of this disease, you know, now that we've said all the terrible, I know there's a silver lining, so silver lining is that it's not painful. You True. Know? So, so, you know, tumors of bone, broken bones, slip discs, you know, um, well, let, let's stay on like tumor of bone. If, if we do nothing, you know, that dog's going to be really, really painful. And, you know, that, that's why those dogs tend to, to you know, get euthanized sooner than dogs with degenerative myelopathy because they're not painful. Right. So to me, that's the silver lining, you know, it unfortunately is. there's nothing that I can, can do to stop this condition, 
Um, no. You know, but the silver lining is, you know, it, oh, I guess the next silver lining is it, it, it takes months, you know, so it's not something like, you know, a week from now your pet's going to be gone. Right. Um, so it's not time to prepare, which is what I'm always big on is bucket lists. And I had uh, a dog Duke on a couple of weeks ago with his mom and we we're talking about his bucket list because he had DM drove across the country with him and and did all these fun things. So we do have it does allow us time. Um, I do think, though, that some dogs may become a little anxious when they can't get up and they you know can't do their normal activities. And I do believe anxiety is a, a form of pain. So uh, there are some dogs that are like, whatever. My girl, Sam, she's like, no problem. I got this. I can't walk and I'm pooping all over your house, mom, but no problem. And we do see, though, an increase of urinary tract infections when they start having, you know, either fecal incontinence because it's, you know, traveling up there and, and things like that. So what about management? Yep. So, um kind of standard big dog management, you know, whether we're talking about slip discs or, you know, tumors or just any reason a dog can't walk, you know, to me, nice, soft padded bed. So we don't want big dogs laying on, on hard surfaces or carpet for extended period of time. Um, I totally get it in South Florida, you know, we can provide the nicest bed ever and that dog's going to want to get on the cool tile. Um, but what we're trying to avoid is, is bed sores or pressure sores. Um, slings um, or, or harnesses to help get that dog up um you know there there are very very fancy ones now that you know are fantastic they're nice and padded they kind of you know go around the hips as opposed to just around the chest so it really helps with that that management um wheelchairs you know can can give mobility you know yeah. that quality of life those, that dog can still chase the ball you know chase squirrels go out on walks things like that um, and not everybody's, you know, open to that. And there's, there's opinions on, well, is that, you know, ethically okay? And, and we're not getting into that. Uh, I, I have seen some amazing, like dogs live amazing lives in wheelchairs, 100%. And I've also seen my girl, Sam, basically give me the middle digit when I tried to put her in a wheelchair. She's like, no, -uh, you're going to be carrying me around. <laughs> so I think the, the pet's personality and, and what they, what they do and, Listen, I got to give a shout out because I, I, I get no money on this, but the help them up harness, everybody knows it's my favorite harness of all time and uh, it's so helpful. Help them up harness. Yeah, that's, I, I didn't know what we were. Uh, what we're allowed to say. No, and like, there's great wheelchair companies and, and, uh, and, and I, I don't even, I'm looking, I'm looking at my girl's wheelchair. It's here because she didn't want it, but I've got a $500 wheelchair right here. So <laughs> I can't so, get rid of it yet. M many times sort of, uh, um, you know, to, to provide traction when that dog's still ambulatory, but slipping out, you know, there, there are different products to, you know, provide traction on the bottom of the surface of the pads, you know, um, uh, booties, things like that. And, you know, there are very, very individual. So some dogs, you know, my, my dog, when he was older, we tried putting on those booties and he was like, no way. He just, you know, was, was doing the this. Kicks. Yeah, it, it, exactly. But and sometimes um, I found with Sam, I went through all, all the booties like and I'm I'm like I'm booty queen <laughs> because I was going through them all. I know my friend Leanne is like, Mary, that that wasn't good. Booty queen. But uh, some of like I love rough wear uh, booties and things like that. But then they all became very heavy and she was dragging and scuffing her feet. So then I went to the balloons and there was so many, you know, so many different options. So I think you just you just got to try them. And I see a lot of people are, are posting their stuff in here. Wow. Look at that. Uh, I know. And I, I talk a lot about mobility management in my book because I've tried all these products and, you know, it's, it's sometimes you just got to try them all to see what's, see what's best for your environment. Like you said, we're here in Florida, there's people in the snow. It's so different. The weight of the pet, like, you know, if you have a Corgi, that's a very different world than if you've got a German shepherd or, you know, my girl was 80 pounds. Uh, now I love me some physical therapy. Yep. So is rehab good. Rehab is basically what our recommendation is when we diagnose a, a dog um, with this condition. So we, we have the conversation, we set the expectations of, hey, there's nothing we can do to cure this. You know, this is sort of the expected decline, you know, here are the things to be looking for. But but what would we recommend? What do we do for, you know, what would we do if, if, if it were our pet? 100% we recommend physical therapy. 
Um, th there is a, a, a study that you know kind of compared dogs with DM or suspected DM um, that got rehab versus those that didn't, and there was a difference in the survival. Um, you know, it's not a perfect study, but um, I think I saw that in the in LARPAR as well. Same thing, like it it was survival time was was better just because you're you know what are all that stuff is so good. Yeah, I mean, for me, if 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 all that the rehab is doing, it's not doing anything to slow the the degeneration of the spinal cord. But if all it's doing is maintaining muscle strength, you know. Correct um joint uh flexibility things like that it's if all it's doing is helping all of the other things that 10 year old large breed dogs get their arthritis you know 100 percent uh supportive of it so um so yeah every single one of our dogs that we diagnose with rehab goes home with a here's a here's rehab you can be doing at home but here's okay. here's a referral to you know someone that rehab, like rehab professionally and that's where I, I think there, there's a lot we can do at home. So it's not like you have to go all the time to rehab. Uh, and I, I did drop my girl off twice, twice a week to rehab because I kind of, I needed the break. And, you know, for those of you out there, like this is tough. And even though she didn't have the same disease, she, it was like a DM dog. So I needed to have her somewhere else and somebody taking care of her, but I still did my own PT at home. Uh, somebody asked about the Assisi loop. Now, do you know about that? I know about it. I don't know enough to, to yeah, I, give it I don't up. think it helps. What they, they say, I don't think they've done any research on it for helping this. I know it's been looked at for, for dogs with slip discs. I'm, I'm not sure about for degenerative myelopathy. I, I have zero personal experience yeah. um, to, to comment. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, laser therapy? Um, I... So we, we do laser therapy um, specifically for our dogs with, you know, slip discs as part of their post-operative pain management status, um, po excuse me, post-operative pain management uh, um, protocol. Um, I guess with regards to degenerative myelopathy, and again, no studies, no proof to suggest that it's going to help the spinal cord change the dog's genes or stop the degeneration of, of, of the spinal cord. You All know, right. is there a place for it, you know, with, with treating arthritis, um, you know, for that same rationale of, of physical therapy, you know, absolutely. Um, but to me, it's, it's all about, you know, letting the owner know what to expect. What, what do we, what do we expect this to do? What will it help? What might it help? You know, what's the likelihood of it hurting? What are the costs and just, help them make that decision. Um, okay. I'm going to hit some of these questions because, you know, we got, yeah. we got to hit, we got to hit a couple of these. So I've got Robin with her 17 year old pug. Okay. Dan. You're, you're speaking to me. I'm a, I'm a pug <laughs> guy. So. I know. That's why I had to say this. Stands like a sawhorse with all four legs wide apart and stoops low. Is this part of DM? Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll blanketly say this now before, before, um, oh. if your question. Yeah. But, wait, you even said to me, don't, don't ask personal questions, but this is just, I like the sawhorse. No, 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 no. I, I I'm, I'm fine with personal questions. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that I might give you too much of a personal answer and, you know, so, um, it, it's, it's challenging for me having never seen your dog you know, and, yeah. and, and medically inappropriate for me to, you know, say too much, diagnose, treat, prescribe, et cetera. So okay. you know, we got ha the having put that disclaimer out there, yeah. um, do pugs get degenerative myelopathy, um, years ago? So, so yes, I think they get DM. Um, most of, I, I think many dogs that years ago were, um, diagnosed with degenerative myelopathy probably actually have a different condition that, you know, over the last five, eight years, now that we're doing MRIs more, we're, we're recognizing more that can cause slowly progressive, non-painful rear limb weakness. Um, and in pugs, that's, you know, a, a constrictive myelopathy or subarachnoid diverticulum. There are different names that we use for that. So I guess when I hear older pug with rear limb weakness, that's non-painful, that's progressive, plus or minus urinary or fecal incontinence. Um, I'm thinking that condition. Um, so 
pug myelopathy, constrictive myelopathy, um, facet hypoplasia. Those are kind of the names that that different neurologists use. We're throwing out some some hot terms now. Just describe that. Um, you're McDreamy now. You're throwing out these big words. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm I. Uh, <laughs> but there are other conditions that I that think is on are, your list for this girl that are on my list for this. Yes, okay. I apologize. I, I tend to say the same thing five different ways. And now, okay, someone asks about any merit to Dr. Clemens' regimen. Um, we have so, to be sensitive with this. Clemens was is this our Clemens? Th this Wait. is Dr. Yeah, so so Dr. Clemens, uh, who was one of the neurologists at UF when when we were students. Um, he was my, 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 my mentor. He, he went to bat for me when I got in trouble in, in, in vet school. That's a story for another time. Um, but, uh, um, um, still awaiting appropriate studies that show that there's a, um, a, okay. a significant difference, um, uh, of, of treating, degenerative myelopathy. I you know, think it's, this I was think, all before, you know, many of the recommendations were back from the seventies, eighties before we actually knew that it was a genetic condition. So one, right. you know, one of the first things that I said when we thought it was uh, nutritional or, you know, environmental or toxic or, or things like that, that's where a lot of this came from. Right. Do I have any problem with, you know, physical therapy, you know, not at all. I actually recommend it. Do I have any problem, you know, with acupuncture? No one asked about that or I didn't see that, but, um, you know, do I have any problem with that? Cause you know, that's one of the, the, that's one of Dr. Clemens things Do I have any problem with, you know, nutritional support. Absolutely not. I mean, I, I think these dogs should be on a, an excellent plane of nutrition. Um, but with regards to setting up these owners that is this going to cure my dog? Um, you know, no, are they reasonable things to be doing? You know, absolutely. You know, diet, gentle physical activity, acupuncture, you know, things like the, uh, you know, aminocaproic acid and stuff like that. I'm not even sure if Dr. Clemens nowadays will, will recommend that. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably, uh, not appropriate for me to answer on his behalf. So I, I, I don't, I don't know what exactly in 2022, yeah. Dr. Clemens is is even recommending, you know. I think it's important for people to know, like, we also want scientific data and proven and proof proven stuff, right? Like there's so many things out there that we could try. And you know, and what, what bothers me sometimes, Dr. Wong, is is things that we know work or have studies on, people won't do, but then they'll go to the art festival and get something that, you know, some I'm like, but it's not even been proven. You could try it, but it may hurt. But listen, if you want to do crystals, go for it. Well, quartz, I don't mind. Uh, quick question on if a dog is negative for the gene, could they still have it? To, my, my understanding is there are documented. So after the pet has passed away and they did the 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 autopsy, um, it's exceedingly rare. So um, okay. if I had done that test on my dog and I had you know two uh, good copies. Um, I, I would absolutely be looking for something else as, as the cause. But my understanding is I, I, I believe that they've, even despite having two good copies, there are isolated, okay. documented um, times. Uh, loss of appetite? Um, typically not as, as one of the first or common, common things. Um, you know, it's not one of the things I associate with degenerative yeah. myelopathy. I, sure, I you know, the complications of, of um, being a big dog that's non-ambulatory, you know, do those dogs get pneumonia? Sure. Do they get urinary tract infections? You know, that, that could cause appetite to go, sure. But a typical symptom of DM, no, it's not one of the things that I, yeah. I think about. Um, makes me worry more systemic stuff, whether it's problems, you know, kidney disease, liver disease, um, or whether it's a different neurological disease that's causing the rear limb weakness, like cancer, like infections, stuff like that. Like my girl, Sam, they'll, they will all eventually lose urinary and fecal control. You're saying dogs with DM? Yeah. Um, if, if, if kept Let that. natural um, yeah. nature take its course. 
that they, they will typically become urinary or fecal incontinent. Yeah, I'm trying to bang through some of these. Uh, let's see. I, I love somebody said they their dog didn't love the wheelchair, but they loved the stroller. And that's, you know, sometimes has to happen. Um, let's see. Oh boy. Oh, a lot of people are, are liking some stuff. Uh, since DM isn't painful, is it silly just to, you know, somebody's giving them NSAIDs and GABA, gabapentin. I would say, I mean, they could also have arthritis. So that's important. And we said that earlier, like they could have other things. So if it's been diagnosed with arthritis, but if it's just DM, yeah, yeah. So, so NSAIDs, gabapentin, tramadol, whatever it is, isn't going to help DM. Correct. Is that sometimes part of our treatment regimen? You know, absolutely. But we're more using that for kind of the the other conditions that that old large breed, older yeah. large breed dogs get. Um, but under the recommendation of your veterinarian. And the gene test is a blood test. Yeah. So there are actually two ways um, of, of of doing the test. So. Um, you can actually order a, an at-home cheek swab. Very, very simple. Um, you know, you go to the, the OFA website. Um, you can order it. You put in your address, your credit card. They send you the, the swab, um, and then you send it in. Um, and that's useful for, you know, your particular, um, particular dog. Um, the way we do it at, the, at, at our office is we will send in whole blood. Um, and you know, my my understanding is that's more beneficial to the um, to, to the lab. They're able to to bank it. They're able to you know use for future studies. Um, I, I I don't believe that there's a difference in the accuracy. Um, so I think both are you know completely valid tests. Um, we do whole blood because that's what the the lab has at least told me that they they prefer. That they like better. Nice. Okay. So listen, I know you got to get back to work. You got, you got spinal cords to fix, brain. I have to go pick up my son. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> real life. I'm good. I, 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 and I was scrolling through. So most we've kind of covered or, or, and we can, I'll answer some of these offline as well. Cause I don't want to take up all your time. And this has been so helpful. I, you know, I, it's such a, such a frustrating disease because there is no cure and uh and it's hard especially these bigger guys it's it is i i know it's hard to manage them um and now you are located in south florida so i know you have right near me in jupiter palm beach county we got uh one of your uh clinics but you're in miami and boynton beach, boynton beach. and drum roll drum roll we're, we're opening a location in virginia beach virginia in august of of this year. So yes, we're, we're branching out. Branching out. I love it. This is great. So we're not just, uh, you know, Florida based anymore, which is everybody's saying, thank you so much for, for your help. So this, this was awesome. And, uh, and yes, thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for taking my girl, Sam, everybody at seven was so wonderful. Uh, and, um, and this was, this was a, a long one, but I think a really important one. And, uh, and thank you so much for your time. And like I said, people, I'll, uh, I'll answer comments throughout the next you know hour or so. And, uh, oh, Layla, Leia says, come to California. <laughs> and if your veterinary does recommend seeing a neurologist, they'll usually be able to tell you when one's nearby. Uh, and sometimes they are hours away, though. So that's uh, you're few and far between. How many neurologists in the in the country? The, the number they throw out is like 350. I, I honestly don't know. It's it's probably more than that. Um, it's yeah, it's not a lot. That's not 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 enough. So not a, not enough. Uh, listen, I ain't going back to school though, so you can't have me. Uh -uh. I'll hire you. <laughs> you'll hire me that's way too much studying all right everybody thanks so much thanks so much dr Thank Wong. i really appreciate it I, Take care, I, I enjoyed it it was fun seeing you and i i appreciate all you've you've done for me over the years so uh you're very welcome thank you everybody bye thank you